Okay, so quick recap for what we did last week. So last week we did chapter 11, which starts out, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen for, by it the men of old gained approval. And then the preacher gave us a list, and he went through all these examples from the Old Testament. Right, so we had basically faith is the basis of our faith is the basis of faith in God's unseen gifts and God's attestation of the people of old who had faith in those promises that he made, which they did not live to see fulfilled, which is what the preacher will talk about tonight. So we have this catalog of the attested people of faith. Uh, and so we talked about God's approval of Abel's offering, God's assumption of Enoch into heaven, God's salvation of Noah and his family, um, Abraham is the archetype of faith, so we had three examples uh, from his life, and then actually four examples from his life. Uh, then we had other patriarchs, so Isaac's blessing of Jacob, Jacob's blessing of Joseph's sons, and Joseph's instruction about bringing his bones to the promised land. Then we had three examples from the life of Moses, and then three examples from the life of uh, No, then we had, sorry, then we had talked about the people uh, leaving Egypt by the, through the Red Sea, the collapse of the walls of Jericho, and Rahab's escape from destruction. And we saw how that was like an entire summary of Christian doctrine all in that chapter. There was a lot going on. Uh, so after we heard all those examples, now tonight the preacher is uh, going to expound on that. So he's really come to his denouement. This is the big climax of the sermon. Started last week, and then this chapter and the next chapter will conclude it. So we're going to do verses 1 to 24 tonight. Those verses that we're not going to read aren't in the lectionary, uh, so we don't hear those in church. And it's just a recapitulation of the stuff we've heard in previous chapters, which says, uh, don't leave the faith, don't become an apostate. It's just a warning, again, to people not to do that. Uh, so we're not missing too much by skipping those few verses. So let's go ahead and read chapter 12. Okay, so Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. 
For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Okay, so there's a lot of kind of cryptic language to start with in this chapter. All right, so again, chapter 11 ended with God's statement that none of those people of faith had yet reached the goal because God provided something better that they would ultimately attain. So now we switch from the past, all of these patriarchs and folks, to the present, and again, in this book, the present means in the divine service, in worship. Okay, so those people of faith, even now, they surround the congregation and us invisibly, just as Jesus is now invisible to us. Uh, they both testify through the word, right? We read the Old Testament, and the words that, that we read about them testify to faith, just as the words of Christ testify to us, and as those words also encourage us. Okay, so therefore, the congregation can strip off for the race. So when you ran a foot race in the ancient world, you did it naked. You didn't have anything that was going to, you know, they were ahead of their time. We have fancy, like, super-engineered garments that sprinters and stuff wear to cut down their wind resistance, right? So they said, yeah, you don't want your stuff flapping around. So they stripped down naked, and they ran the race with confidence, laying aside every encumbrance, as the preacher says, which is what he's talking about. So let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So we're stripping off the rags of sin to be able to run this race unencumbered. Right? So they're being encouraged to run with endurance, another way of saying perseverance. And they're giving them, the preacher's giving them three ways to persevere. So one, persevere to the end despite hardships. Number two, endure discomfort, hardship, and pain. And three, patiently expect God's promise, uh, God's promise intervention, because he will promise to intervene in the suffering we have in this life, either by removing the suffering or we die and we go to heaven where there is no suffering. So one way or another, that suffering will end sometime. Okay. And we can look at, if you look at 1 Corinthians 9.25. Real quick. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, 1 Corinthians 9.25, everyone who competes in the games, right, exercises self-control in all things, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body to make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Okay, so he's talking about running a race. He's also talking about boxing. You know, you just don't box like a spaz. You, when you're practicing like shadow boxing, you're boxing like a spaz. You're imagining an opponent, but you're not. But when you are punching the heavy bag or the little bag, you have to do it right or you're going to, number one, you're going to hurt yourself. But you do that like you're actually boxing a person. Uh, and likewise with running a race, you have to run it with endurance to the end. You don't, uh, don't let anything distract you. Of course, we do all those things, right? We let things distract us, uh, which is when we, again, verse 2, fix our eyes on Jesus. All right, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. All right, so we're to fix our eyes on Jesus' obedience. So you have his passive and his active obedience, uh, whose course that he ran 
far exceeds anything we face, right? He was tempted to seek refuge and avoid the cross, right? He was tempted in the wilderness. He was tempted in the garden. You know, he didn't want this, but his passive obedience, allowing himself to be beaten, allowing himself to be crucified, and his active obedience to actively make the journey to Jerusalem to be crucified. All right. So he was tempted to avoid all that, but he set that aside along with his power as God, right? He did not actively use his divine power all the time. And then even then, he only used a little of it. And when he was crucified, he used none of it. And didn't, so he set his power as God aside, ultimately facing the cross, and he was able to endure for the joy that was placed before him. So the joy that was placed before him is the joy of pleasing his father. And the other thing that he enjoys is then inheriting a people of faith by his death and resurrection. So in verse 3, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. <coughs> Jesus is our example of a life lived in faith. He endured hatred at the hands of sinners, and he kept on his mission anyway. So no matter what we face, Jesus' trial exceeded them. So we look to him as the author and example of faith because everything he experienced way far exceeds anything that we face in this life. Okay, then in verse 4, we haven't battled sin in such a way that the only way to win the battle is to die. Okay, Jesus had to die. He won the battle against sin. The way to win the battle was to die. But we can't say that our trials have been so extreme that sin is necessary and reasonable. Okay, we can't say that, that everything has gotten so bad that our only way out is to sin. That's never an answer. All right, and our trials have never, we have never been uh, you know, asked to bleed for the faith, not yet. Some have. You know, that's another way of looking at it is we haven't, no, nobody that he is writing to has had to lay down their life for the faith. may come to that. But regardless of all that, and it may come to that, and it may require your death, but sinning is never the reasonable answer, though it's the easy answer. When verses 5 and 6 are quoting Job 5.17, Proverbs 3.11, and Psalm 3, which we talked about. So in those three verses, it's talking about discipline. So telling us not to reject the discipline of the Lord because God uses trials as discipline. Uh, and he does that for us to grow and to learn endurance. Some of us, he asks to learn that lesson more extremely than others for whatever reason. You know, and again, God doesn't create the hardship. He doesn't create the evil things that happen to us. None of that is his creation but he can use it. He can use it to work good. He can use it to work discipline. He can also use it to help us learn our weaknesses and also helps us to crucify the flesh where it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? So when we become Christians, when we are drowned in our baptism and we are reborn, born again as a new creation, now it's Christ that lives in us. Our flesh is crucified, but it's not quite dead yet until Jesus comes again or we go to heaven until the last day. So we have to continually crucify the flesh. It's a daily struggle. Daily, we have to crucify the flesh. Right? And then he continues talking about discipline, verses 7 and 8. Since God teaches us how to live as sons, we are supposed to endure the course as Jesus did, persevering with that patient expectation so that eventually we will benefit from enduring, from what it has to teach us, what we, what we are to take away from it. So let us just, well, let's go through. Yeah, let's stop there. 
So what do you think about that? Because I feel like I'm going kind of fast. Anything seen? What do you think about that so far, this chapter so far? Like any comments or thoughts? It, this uh, verse four, and I think the striving against sin. Mm -hmm. That kind of goes to the conversation you and I had a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> something that is never going to go away. You're never going to overcome it. Never going to go until until Jesus got you know, until the, the, okay. the second coming. And striving seems like such a waste of energy. So yeah. an alcoholic shouldn't fight against the temptation. I'm not sorry. To, so it, because an alcoholic's desire to drink will never go away for the rest of their life. No, no, no. But it's the same thing. I, 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 okay. okay. Uh, come on. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, then you're right. You know. It, it, but the my my word is still aware to strive against it. He's not going. He may never overcome the desire to no. want to drink. No. 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 He won't. But being aware that that is one of his frailty, one of his mm -hmm. you know weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. It's. It just seems like it's a too, too strong a word for something that's never going to go away. Being aware of it and knowing that every day it's going to be something you have to address is, that's fine. But so in, in, it, in running that race, spirit, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, so in running that race, the runner has to jump over that hurdle every time it's in front of them. Okay. Yeah. That's true. So every time, every time he clears the hurdle, he doesn't take another drink or, or what have you. Exactly. But and that's what I'm saying. That hurdle is always going to be there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to strive against it. It's going to be there. Mm -hmm. I, I strive is not going to make it go away. You know. No. And so just being aware that this is a part of my makeup. This is something that I, a life frailty, my human. I'm not going to let it have I too much that much power. You know, over the rest of my life, that I miss out on, on might miss out on something else. What it could be, I don't know. But that just seems like almost like a lack, a lack of faith. Or well, on a scale of one to ten, that would make my. Even though I think I'm a twelve, it would make my faith be less than what I than what it actually is. I, I just can't. I, I can't get past that word strive. I can't get past the word struggle when it comes to the word sin. Okay. Just I think I can answer my question. Sure, hit it. I have an opinion. I think, because I see what you're saying, and I think it's can really, I, I can, I, okay, I understand what you're saying because I think it's really hard because we all have something, no mm -hmm. matter what it is, we all have something that we've got to fight every single day. Yeah. And I think it's very discouraging to think we may never overcome it and that's always going to be in our way. I understand that. but. You could look at it two ways. One, that it could weaken your faith, knowing that you're never going to get there, or it can completely strengthen your faith, because we're supposed to um, walk by faith, not by sight. Mm -hmm. So even though we struggle with that every day, over and over and over again, knowing that we can't win it by ourselves, doesn't that just strengthen our faith like a thousand times over? It strengthened me. Exactly. It strengthened my faith, but it, I'm not striving to overcome it. My faith is what's helping me overcome it. It's what's making me deal with it, making it have less power over me, making mm -hmm. it easier to go, you know, over o over the hurdles, over the, you know, I not take the drink. Because I have that peace that comes with faith. And so I did just, I'm You don't thinking. view it as a struggle, then. I'm sorry? You don't view it as a struggle then. Is that, you know, the, something you're striving oh. for because you're... Well, they may. Yeah, they may, but I'm just, you know, that why you're having such trouble with the word struggle or strive, because the faith is there to give us strength. When it comes to something that's not going to go away, I have to the problem. Okay. okay. All right, so you're...
driving to the goal. But it's not that it'll never go away, because it will someday. Yeah, it will. Oh, yeah. It, it, will. I mean, it will someday go away. <laughs> this side of eternity. You know, well, it made my cup sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So the endurance with which you're running the race is not of yourself. Right? That's it's your the endurance by which you are enduring the striving in the race. The endurance you have is faith, is faith. It's the faith, right? That's what what the author is saying, what the preacher is saying. So, you know, by definition, the striving is something God is doing within you. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's it's not yeah, with man it's impossible, with God all things are possible. You know, it's, if, if you view it solely as this is my willpower or whatever that's going to allow me to persevere in this race knowing this hurdle is going to be in front of me, then yeah, it's foolishness to think you can do that on your own. The endurance and the ability to continue running the race is your faith. That is what makes it possible. And right. increase my faith and the... Right, so, so the conditioning and the endurance to withstand sin is your faith. Exactly. So to, um, I'd rather think of it as increasing my faith not struggling against sin. I'd rather have the power of, you know, the, the situation. But you do struggle against sin. Yeah. But, See, I mean, but that's what you're doing. yeah. That's what you're doing. But I'm not struggling with faith. I'm, I'm joyful for every time I don't take a drink. You know, my faith increases, you know. Right. So I'm not going to look at the struggle. I'm going to be joyful for the, for the increase in my faith. And because today I didn't take one in maybe three days before I had the desire. So my faith is going three times in that. So I'm going to look at that three times, mm-hmm. the, the growth of that faith, and not the struggle and, or not, not the inclination to take the drink. I'll put it that way. Okay. Yeah. So, so that, that's just... Yeah, I guess in one way the, the the struggling or the striving could be sin itself. If you want to look at it that way, that's not how the word strive is being used, and I think that's a translation issue with the word used for strive. But uh, you can think of it's like the struggle is because you're a sinner. Because if you weren't a sinner, there'd be no struggle. There'd be no need to strive. You're not wrestling against sin because you wouldn't be a sinner you there would be it wouldn't be your nature so that that might be way a problem with the word strive i think but we're all saying the same thing so yeah maybe strive there could be a better word for us in the modern age perhaps because striving or even struggling sounds like something that could be overcome and like you said it's never going to be overcome on your own but you, we know, we know, you know that, you know you're not doing it on your own. What, uh, I'm trying to think, I'm thinking, and not hurt myself at the same time. So, Hebrews, I gotta look it up. 12. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, resisted it is just resisted. Struggling. Resisting, struggling. They are all the same word. Yeah. There's a strife. I gotta do a word study on that word, but yeah. That that resisting and struggling, that's all the same word in, in the Greek that the preacher's using. Yeah, anyway. Okay, that's a good, good, dis- good discussion. Okay, so now in verse 9, it switches tone a little bit because th- this is a preacher thing that we do. You know, we'll talk about, you know, you, 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 because it's something you got to pay attention to. You, 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 and then all of a sudden you'll flip it and go, we. Is it like, was he better than us? No. It's a rhetorical device, so it'll be you, 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 and then he flips it. Now we, it was for discipline that you endure, uh, verse 9, 
Furthermore, we had earthly fathers, right? So he's including himself now. We had earthly fathers to discipline us when we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. All right. Discuss among yourselves for a minute. I'll be right back. Discuss among yourselves for a minute. Well, let's talk about this, the Lord disciplining us. Does he do that today? Like, talk about how he uses things in our lives, how that can be used for discipline, how it really doesn't seem like it at the moment, which is what the preacher's talking about. Just talk about that for a minute. You know, discuss what you think about how does God discipline us today? How do we see that? Do we see that? Because that's kind of weird to talk about, I think. I'll be right back in like a minute. Excuse me. So we're, we're, huh? Talk about how to because God disciplined us these days. Mm -hmm. And my answer to that, well, it's called COVID 19. Okay. That should be teaching people a lot of stuff. Pardon? I said, that should probably be teaching us a lot of different things. Absolutely. And the, the one thing that, that comes to my mind is that. He had, he's a jealous God, and he said he had no other gods before him. Mm -hmm. And we had become so self-centered and greedy that everything that he, well, many things that are blessings from him, we had put before him and thanking him for them using for his good. And that includes our families, our marriages, our churches. Many times to the pulpits are not, the mess from the pulpits nowadays are being you don't want to offend anybody, you know. So rather than say, uh, "Oh, I want to offend people," <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, so that, and he had enough. And we're going to learn. And whatever we have to do to go along with this COVID nineteen restrictions is nothing new. It, it, Old Testament's full of plagues, discipline. <laughs> yeah. right? And it's a uh, and we've done the same thing. And what I hope comes up, and I, it's not, it's not all bad. One of the things that I see is more of an awareness of how much we need each other, even if it's just going to the store for someone or thinking about yeah. uh, someone other than ourselves. Well, good. There was, there was a, a good story a while back, I don't remember what news outlet it was on. I get this thing that, that kind of gives me headlines from lots of different sites so you don't have to subscribe to every news outlet and it lets you save them to read them later and it was talking about uh people were finding out even introverts 
with quarantine were like, yeah, this is a little nuts. I'm going a little crazy. It's like, I usually, you would think an introvert is gonna be like the beginning of work, like when we had to work from home. I'm going, this is awesome. I mean, this is great. First off, like my wife and daughter are home too. That's more together than we had for a while, which also was like a bit much too, because we're all super independent. It's like we're all there for a long time. So, you know, so that teaches stuff. But like you're all, you're working from home. This is great. I mean, you just, okay, we do video and send that out and do this and do that. And for all these introverts are like, this is awesome. And then it goes on and on and on. And you're like, this is nuts. I mean, this is, this is getting awkward and uncomfortable, even for people who like to be alone because it's how we recharge, right? Extroverts go to be around people to recharge. Introverts go off by themselves to recharge. But even the introverts are going, yeah, this is nuts. I'm going, yeah, I can attest to that. Yeah, it was getting a little nutty. So, you know, yeah, it taught us we are social creatures. Even if we don't like to be with people all the time, we like to be with people sometimes. And when you tell us no, it, it, it's strange. It doesn't feel right. You know, so we hopefully learn maybe we need other people occasionally. All right? Um, so, yeah. Our churches, uh, you send them, uh, I, I, well, we don't know if some of them will ever recover, you know. And then there are some that are growing by leaps and bounds electronically. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, however, they, they do it. And it makes you wonder, well, what's different over there than the different over here, you know? Not that anybody can ever answer that, but I think the neighbor, you know, cuts out my, he has three children, they just stay at home, dad always had, well, been for many years. We're talking about the kids being home from school. And uh, three nice kids, good Christian family. Anyway, uh, I asked him how the kids were doing, and he said, fine, I said, all six of them. He said, six of them have three, and no, we have six. There are three that you're raising, and three that you've taught, and then there's three more that the world has raised and influenced. I said, so they'll show up. About a month later, he came by and said, I met those other three kids. And I said, oh, you did? <laughs> I said, and? He said, a little rough around the edges, but not so bad. Which was a, you know, accolades for him, you know. But, but it was this, and but the awareness, and hey, we were talking about how do you find out about that. You just be quiet and watch, and watch them and listen. Because there are people, and even are in, George has been gone before COVID, but uh, as I think back, marriages, you know, there are things that it, it's different. However, well, I don't know where, but anyway, uh, it, it's just, it's amazing how households can either sink or swim, churches are sink or swim. And even though people are introverts, they find out that they still are social people. They yeah. No man's an island, no matter how much you want to be by yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and you, you know, we get the message across too. You know, one of the things that we've been taught is, you know, we can't be solitary Christians because there's no such thing. You know, you can't be a Christian on your own, me and God. I mean, if that's the situation that happens, then that's different. But it, you can't just say, well, I'm going to go on my porch with my Bible and I don't need church. And no, no, you, we are communal creatures. We're supposed to gather together around word and sacrament, uh, and you can't do that on your own. You can still bear fruit even though we're not sitting and are supposed to. If nothing else, more of our being one of these more around. Make a better. Pastor Bill said something one time. When someone asked him the question, why does God let bad things happen to good people? And his answer was to make a better Christian out of you. And I thought, mm -hmm. And this is a, this COVID-19 is going to make a bit of Christian out of us. Yeah, the bad thing might not happen to you to teach you something. It might be to teach something else. It all might make you able to receive care for somebody so that somebody can be a good neighbor to you. Yeah, he doesn't make the bad things happen, but he can use it for his will. Wasn't a question about discipline? Yeah. So what do you make of... so? Talking about that, good discussion. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. What do you make of that verse? Scourges. For 
six. No, I didn't say how. I said I didn't say does he. I said how does he. So, 33, 33 is a look, uh, yeah, paidoi, that's a weird word, uh, I mean it has a lot of meanings, but, on mass, yeah, mastigo, that's where we get ma the word masochism from. So someone that likes to, <coughs> someone is a masochist who likes to inflict pain on other people. No, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, like I got it backwards. Yeah. So someone who likes to be have pain inflicted on them is a masochist. Um, that is the word. The same word we get that word. That word comes from the same Greek word, root as the word scourge. Here. Yes, yeah, so it's masticoi. Uh, yeah, in the uh, Roman sense of the word, so like in in the in the Holy Week sense of the word, scourge to be whipped. Yeah, so it's inflicting it, but it also means yeah, in uh, whip, flog, scourge, punish. It has all those meanings. So yeah, it is inflicting bodily harm. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. What do you make of that verse? Because that's a, that's a tough verse there. I don't know. Is it because our Heavenly Father's punished us, A, because they love us, and B, they want to teach us something. Mm -hmm. God is the same way. He loves us and wants to teach us something. Mm -hmm. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous, and in that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. O oh, may your loving kindness comfort me according to the word of your servant. So that's part of what's being quoted in verse 6 there. And then Proverbs 3.12. Proverbs 3.12 is, For whom the Lord loves, he reproves even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. What does the Septuagint say? That's a good question. Because it's quoting that our Old Testament is translated for Hebrew. I've got to look at i got to look at the Septuagint real quick. Proverbs 3. I say Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3 what? What did I say? Proverbs 3, what? Uh, well. Yeah. The, the, the old the Septuagint has whip. Yeah, mas, um, mastioi. So it's the same, it's the same word, so. Yeah, so the Hebrew has a little bit different than the than the Greek that they're actually quoting. So does God actually inflict harm, bodily harm on us to teach us something? Well, no, that was true in the Old Testament. All the all the tribes, all the groups throughout the ages in the Old Testament, God punished them, mm -hmm. disciplined them. All this is is just bringing it from a large group down to the individual. The same, the same type of okay. So you did not obey me, or you did not do as I asked you to do, or you disobeyed in some.
some manner. So there's consequences. The whole group was punished, or God allowed them to be without his protection, whatever, it depended on the situation. Yep. Well, now he's just bringing it down to the same uh, comparison to the individual in the New Testament. What's the note say for verse 6? Does it have something? The study note? Yeah. It says, if so many judgments, pains, deaths, martyrdoms, crosses, swords, fires, and beasts, with which the saints are chastised, are fatherly rods and loving chastisements, what will be the wrath of the judge over the ungodly? And if his judgment begins at the house of God, what will be the end of those who do not believe the gospel? That's where they went with the study note? Okay. Okay, wow. So, yeah, I wonder who did the commentary on Hebrews. Um, yeah, so that's the Lutheran study Bible note, which is basically saying, look at what happened to the New Testament Christians. You know, so of course you got supposedly being fed to lines in the Colosseum. You had, there's not a lot of evidence of a whole lot of that, uh, but you have the Christians being persecuted and executed and martyrs made in the early church. You know, if that, if God allows that for fatherly chastisement and teaching endurance of the faith, what's he going to do to the people that don't believe? Well, we know the answer to that on the last day. You have a rude awakening. So that even, but that, does, in a way, that does answer the question, well, who's that discipline the example for? Who is all that discipline that these allowing these people to be martyred and burned at the stake and all this stuff that happened to early Christians and later Christians? If God allowed that to happen to them, who is the lesson being taught to? The person being burned at the stake or the person who witnessed it? I'd say both. Both. Well, yeah, I would say the faith of the person being burned at the stake was pretty solid because you don't get burned at the stake for something you don't believe. So I would say the discipline was for others to see what endurance looks like. And that's a heck of an example, right? That's, that's a hard verse. That's why I wanted to see what we were going to make out of it. And yeah, you're right. You saw, you know, like when the, the Israelites are in the wilderness and they don't like the worthless food God gave them, so he sent them snakes to kill them and okay now you got to look at the snake on the pole and you'll live but meanwhile the snake's going to bite you and you're going to die okay he doesn't necessarily send us biting snakes but he may send us viruses does he, is he the one that originated the virus i'm going to teach those people something maybe not but he's going to teach us some kind of discipline from it so yeah it's this hard these are hard verses i don't think there's an easy where you can just fluff it up and go well yeah you know god teaches us stuff like, does he actually send the suffering? He uses it. Yeah, he uses it. Does he send it? He allows it. He did, he did send it in the past. He allowed it in the early church. Does he send it today? I don't think we can answer the question. I don't think he operates that way today. But who am I to say that? This is hard. Yeah, we, we can't answer it. I mean, if God wants to send punishment to somebody, he, he can do it. Absolutely, he can do that. Do it as a discipline? Sure. As a fatherly discipline? Okay. Then there has to be a limit to it. You know. do I, why do bad things constantly happen to me if someone has a ter oh, difficult life? Is that God disciplining them their whole life? I don't think God goes that far. I think he might send a thing here or there to wake us up. Why is all this suffering in the world? Because the world is sinful. So yeah, this is not a cut and dried easy verse, couple verses. That one in particular, that one's hard. That's one of those ones where we just kind of go, okay, so we have again, this cloud of witnesses for us has expanded from all of those folks in the Old Testament, the patriarchs and their kids who relied on the promise even though they didn't necessarily see it fulfilled. We have them as examples of what to do and what not to do because every one of them was a sinner. We have the examples of all these martyrs in the early church in the New Testament, right? Who suffer for their faith as an example to us. 
When does the church grow? When is always? When does the church grow? Times of persecution. That's when the church grows. When the church is persecuted, it explodes. Always has. Always has. Never anything that has lasted in the state of creation that has caused such an uproar and never been solved is persecution of the church. Mm. Yeah, and when you persecute the church, it grows. Go figure. Why would I want to be one of them? They're killing them all. Yeah, the church keeps growing. Church in Ethiopia, growing by leaps and bounds. Do you think it's easy to be a Christian in Ethiopia? No, it is not. You're taking your life in your own hands. If you, be, if you are especially a Coptic Christian in Ethiopia, every morning you wake up might be the day you die. And they don't care, and the church grows. Here we take religion for granted, and they kind of let us do what we want, and the persecution is beginning, and the true conservative Bible-believing Christians are tightening the ranks and going, we're going to stand for this. If they try to tell us we can't do this, we're not going to put up with it. And that's how you can tell between the Bible-believing Christians that actually read the Bible, believe what Jesus says, and the people that just are giving you a gospel that makes you feel good. Because they'll do whatever the government tells them. But then you see with this COVID thing we saw, a lot of churches just said, yeah, we're not, yeah, we're going to shut the doors. They told us we can't have church. And others said, we will find a way. No, we're not going to not have the Lord's Supper. No, we're not going to not have church. Right? Now, I mean, could we have done things different? Sure, we could have. And maybe even been more, we're not doing what the government tells us. We tried to play ball and be within the law and still do what was right. You know, and others caved, and then others absolutely said, well, we're still going to meet inside, and we're still going to gather together, and we're going to go up there, and we're not changing communion practice because this is God's stuff, not man's, whatever. They were pretty hardcore, some folks. So that taught us a lot about what do we actually believe, teach, and confess as a church. So was that persecution? Did we feel persecuted? Kind of. I mean, it's not like we were being burned at the stake. Right? It's not like they were threatening to cut our head off. It's not like that kind of persecution at all, but it was a little taste of what persecution could be like. And you saw some people caved immediately, and others said, yeah, no, this isn't right. It was not an arbitrary situation. It was to not spread this yeah. thing. Sure. So it wasn't just like, you can't do it at the end of it. And we are told to submit to go on their authorities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Both, both ways were, well, it was complicated. It was complicated. You know, and I'm not condemning the way anybody handled anything. I'm not naming particulars. Anything like that is just saying that was a little example of what persecution could be like. Because, And it wasn't actually coming from the government. It was people saying, well, the government said, which they never said. And it was, ugh, there was a lot of stuff going on. So it's a little example. So. Yeah, but that's when the church grows. Okay, like I said, those couple of verses, they're not easy. That's, that's one of those things where we just love to skip it and not read it because it makes us feel weird to actually try to comprehend what is it saying? Is that saying God like lashes out at us to teach us a lesson? Yeah, that's what it says. Yeah, it, it's a possibility. No, that's not where the hard and horrible things in your life are coming from. You know, that's living in a broken world. But God will, like you said, use it to work his will. Okay, so verse 10, going back to where we were, verse 10. Right, so our earthly fathers are supposed to instruct us out of their own wisdom or whatever seems right to them, the best they can do, they're supposed to, for the sake of their children and for his own gain. Because that's what fathers did back in the day. Okay, you raised your son to be good at whatever it is you do so that you would gain by, when you're old, he can pick up the slack and keep things going. So it was of his, for his benefit as well as for the benefit of the next generation because he had to do this. Because he has some time he has to hand over responsibility and his assets to the next generation of the family, right? 
So how much more so your heavenly father, right, is the example they're making, because God doesn't benefit from this at all. Yeah, what does he gain by being a good father to us? Nothing. He does it because he loves us, because he is a good father. He's not doing it for personal gain like a human father does, because, yeah, even when you're just trying to raise your kid right, even to take the pride of, of watching the fruit of what you sowed, okay? It's always tainted with sin, everything good we do. But God doesn't benefit only for their present and future benefit and for their present and future holiness. So, to put the pieces together that the preacher's been given to us, so he makes us holy through this discipline. He makes us holy in the divine service where we become like him, right? We become like him by taking in the body and blood of Christ, which helps make us holy. We take in the word, all the means of grace, which continue to work sanctification in us, Continues to apply Christ's righteousness to us. And then verse 11, we can probably identify with too, regardless of how old we are. All instruction seems to deliver more sorrow than joy. Right? So at the time, when you're learning the lesson, it didn't necessarily feel too good. Now, discipline seems pleasant at the time. Right. In my translation. Yeah, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So it's like, well, you're not going to appreciate this now, but someday you'll understand. Right? If we heard that, this will make sense someday. Right? And such it was for Christ. Right? It was, his life was not easy. His life was one of sorrow. A man of sorrow is unacquainted with grief. Right? And then the Christians also, and, and we should point out, you know, the, the, these Hebrew converts to Christianity in Rome are persecuted to a degree. You know, so they are undergoing persecution, and the preacher is appealing to that. Like, hey, you're undergoing this discipline now. Remember, keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes on the prize at the end of the race. Be steadfast because you're being persecuted, but in the end... The end result of being instructed by God is the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So he goes again to his, his race analogy, right? Verse 12, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. He's exhorting to these runners of the race to straighten their limp hands. Your hands, your hands get limp. You need to straighten them out. Uh, their hands are limp. Their knees are disabled. Right, if you're a runner like that, you're not going to finish the race. You're going to drop out. They said, no. Straighten out those limp hands. You, you know, ignore that disabled knee. You keep running. Don't give up and drop out due to hitting a wall of fatigue, cramping muscles. You stay with the team. So let's think about, you know, we're not necessarily talking about sprint here. We're talking about a marathon, right? That's what life is. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Okay. So what do you do? If somebody gets tired in the pack, you draft behind somebody else if you're doing a long distance race, right? So you're leading the pack for a while, you drop back, you draft behind somebody else, you let them pull you along a little bit. You rest and you, got, you exchange the lead, right? Bicyclists do that, but runners can draft too. And it does, it does take off. Um, it works psychologically too, but does physically. It does lighten the burden on you a little bit. That's why geese fly. Yeah, that's why geese fly. That's why they fly the way they fly. Exactly. And they do exchange. It's like one guy's not in the front the whole time. They switch up. Right. I don't like geese much, but that is pretty cool. And they have magnets in their heads, which is also neat. Uh, yeah, so you stay with the pack. You stay with the pack to get healed. Right? And where do we do that? Let's what is the preacher teaching us in this sermon? Where do we do that? Church. church. That's what the whole thing is about. And so you go to church, partake of the means of grace with the brothers and sisters. Because right? that's where you receive healing. You can go sit up on a mountaintop and meditate, but it's not the same. And you're not going to get the benefits that he offers to us because that's where he offers the benefits. 
Okay, so now, in verse 13, now he takes his analogy instead of runners in a pack watching out for each other. Now he is going to treat them as a single body. Right? So make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Right? So now the congregation is presented as a single body. Uh, the lame limb is a single weak person. Right? So what do you do when you got a weak you know, my, my left arm's weak because well, I'm left-handed, so my right arm's weak, so I need to work that one out a little further because it's uneven, right? So you work out the weak limb to get it as strong as the rest, right? So you should encourage the weak member to run in by way of the instruction of the Lord to be healed, to be strengthened in faith. So where are you going to get, if your faith is weak, where is it going to get stronger? In the divine service, you know, again, Go up and sit on a hill with your Bible. Can your strength, weep? can your faith get stronger that way? Yes. Or is it guaranteed to be stronger? We're here. What we're doing, right? Spending time in the Word together. That's one one of the means of grace. And then of course the Lord's Supper. Right. So. Allow ourselves to be healed, allow the weaker member to be healed and strengthened by the divine word. Right now, like the good Lutheran preacher that the writer to the Hebrews is, he's going to start preaching sanctification in verse 14. So pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. All right, so the hearers of the preacher's sermon are now told to pursue peace and sanctification. They don't pursue what they don't have. Okay, so they're not chasing after because he wouldn't be a Lutheran preacher if he was saying you can achieve sanctification because you can't. Sanctification means holiness. You can't achieve holiness. Okay, so they're not pursuing what they don't have already. They're pursuing what already belongs to them. Okay? Because through Christ they have ongoing access to peace and sanctification. Right? Through Christ, we have access to true peace. We have access to Christ's holiness. That's what is applied to us. So we don't have any holiness of our own. We're declared holy. We're declared righteous on account of Christ. So we're not pursuing something that we can achieve. We're not striving for holiness, right? I know, huh? We're not striving for holiness. We're not striving for sanctification. We're going after more of what we already have. Right, in verse 15, the congregation pursues peace and sanctification by watching over each other. So again, there's another, another call. Keep watch that no one misses out on grace by falling behind and dropping out of the race. Because if you drop out of the race, if you stop coming to the gathering to receive the means of grace, Ignore it. Uh, Falling behind. Yeah, missing out on. Yeah, you're missing out on grace. Missing out on grace. We receive grace. Yeah, that sounds better. That's the false short. No, no, I said, I said, miss out on grace or fall behind and drop out of the race. Yeah, the race. Going back. Sorry, go out the grace and race do sound a lot like I'm probably not pronouncing clearly. Yeah. So, if you if you drop out of the race. The race is run while we're still drawing breath, and if we just decide, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore, you've dropped out of the race. So what happens when you drop out of that race? You miss out on grace. You no longer have grace. I guess the Roman Catholics would have called it being in a state of grace, right? And you would no longer be in a state of grace because you committed the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit. You ignored God. You said no. Okay, so neglect of God's grace opens the door to secret apostasy. What is secret apostasy? It's like being not really a Christian anymore, even though you might look like it on the surface, because we don't know what's in people's hearts. And attachment to pagan gods, which is a struggle we all have in the modern world. How do we have attachment to pagan gods? We don't like worship trees or... 
Or, or I don't know the glowing idol we carry in our pocket. I mean, we have we have false idols all around us. They don't have to be statues in the corner. Hello, household gods. You know, like the Romans had. It was ridiculous. The Romans loved adopting everybody else's religion so much that they actually had an altar in their homes, and they had little statues of their household gods that were the gods of their household that they kind of would sprinkle oil and water on sometimes and bless them and honor them because they protected their home. They might not be the same gods as the household next door because they were their household. Yeah, there, there's infinite number of gods. Yeah, it was ridiculous because they loved having lots of gods so much that they would make up ones to, yeah. They were like, well, that's silly. That's silly, superstitious, ancient people thing. Well, we do it all the time. We have all kinds of false gods. Uh, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God that by no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it may be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own both right for a single meal. Yeah. Uh, it's called the root of bitterness is one of these pagan gods or false gods and that's from Deuteronomy 29 18 the root of bitterness yeah you in verse uh, 15 there the root of bitterness Let's see what that I don't remember what it says Deuteronomy 29 so that there will be not among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations, that there will not be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. So they were co talking about the covenant in uh, Moab. Talk about how they lived in the land of Egypt and how you saw their abominations of all these different gods. They had wood, stone, silver, and gold. Uh, and talking about how you know, you're renewing this covenant with the Lord so that there will not be one among you like them who chased after all these ridiculous false gods. And the point being, one single embittered person can bring down an entire congregation. One person that's upset with everything can take it and wipe out an entire congregation and drag them all down if we allow it. And that has happened. That has happened places. Um, that's the root of bitterness. That one bitter whatever bee they have in their bonnet that they decide, well, they're going to they're gonna take all these people down with them for whatever reason. I'll show them. They can drag down an entire congregation. Sometimes it's the pastor. It happens. It happens. Uh, so again, we have that diligent perseverance, awareness. That's why you're supposed to lift one another up when you see one getting weak, because the weak one can turn into the root of bitterness. Things happen that we don't always understand. Dangerous out there, isn't it? Okay, so the third threat, we already had two threats, the third threat to the pursuit of this peace and sanctification uh, is the member of the congregation who is an immoral or godless person. And that's not an either or. So you could have an immoral person or a godless person. You have an immoral, comma, godless person. It's a both and, like Esau. Okay, he committed sacrilege, showed contempt for God's blessing, which was the sacrilege. Okay, lost his inheritance the result of which included all of his illegitimate marriages. And such action then desecrates God's holiness because then you're holding like the Institute of Marriage in contempt, you're holding God's blessing in contempt. I mean, so he goes on, what does he go on to found? He goes on to found pagan nations eventually. Okay, so it's urged that this kind of activity be dealt with uh, pastorally. 
For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found a place for repentance, though he sought it for tears. So he looked for repentance, he did not receive, he did not receive any absolution. Okay. It's urged that that kind of behavior, when we see it, okay, that person needs some kind of pastoral care. And if it's another pastor, pastors have pastors. That guy needs care also. Um, the congregation is not defiled, so the congregation is not defiled. So God's holiness is not defiled. And that, so that individual will not be rejected at the last day. You know, the, you see this person, the first thing you want to do is like excise him like a tumor and no, you want to make sure that this guy does not lose his faith. I don't know why it's a guy. It could be a girl. It could be a woman. Uh, this individual, you don't want to shun them and then they lose all faith and all hope. And then the end of days comes. They could have repented. They could have been, or like Esau, wanted to and did not find any solace, right? Who's that on? Is it on Esau? Is it on that congregation that cast that person out? So there's... Kind of a kind of a, another rough patch here about how to deal with this. Okay, so he kind of ends a section now. Ooh, I got a I got a lot. To, I didn't think I was going to have enough for tonight, and I'm like halfway through what I got for this chapter. Do we want to stop there? It's like eight twenty. Okay, let's st- let's stop there. Since that's the end of a section, we will finish chapter 12 next time. And then uh, 13, 13 is going to, yeah. We may start 13 and then it'll be another week. So we're going to be with that. I want to start Acts, but I don't want to shortchange this and not finish it correctly. So we'll end there. Questions, comments, anything? I'm still thinking about kindness describing and how it's strong. Yeah. One is, even if we know we're not going to overcome whatever it is, what if we still have to strive? Because what's our only choice? Our only other choice would be not to strive, which means we kind of just be like waiting for it to have a perspective to get out So if I don't keep trying to overcome this every day, I'm just going to sit here and wait for that to happen. So that doesn't help our relationship or help our faith in any way. Stephen Hawking. Everybody knows who Stephen Hawking is. He was an astrophysicist. He had motor neuron disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. So like, basically the only part of his body that still worked would be a one finger to work a computer mouse in a wheelchair, right? So he had to communicate by doing the tap out phrases. He did more brilliant physics with one finger than the generations of physicists who broke the mouse. So did he strive against that disease? No, because it didn't get any better. But he also didn't quit. He could have just had a huge big plea party and not did physics anymore, which he didn't do anything worthwhile until he got so cut over. But a uh, fascinating guy. I think he unfortunately died when he was a kid. I don't think he died either. He was kind of here and there. But, uh, But no, he he didn't strive against the disease. He had stuff that helped him 
flip it. So he had his wheelchair, he had his computers, he had armada of technicians who kept all this stuff running. Um, so we have faith, we have the word, we have the means of grace, we have the Bible, we have the church, we have the congregation. So we have all of these satellite things that help us navigate and encourage us, and encourage us in this race that if it was left to our own devices, we'd just be sitting on the side of the road going, damn it. Okay, so again, not striving, but it's there's a support system without which, which is faith, which is faith. So, I mean, that's my analogy. Take it or leave it, I guess. I think it's an okay one. Um, actually, if he had not gotten sick, he never would have known that he was sick for himself, which is also interesting. This was a guy, a real quick story, real quick story. So, when Stephen Hawking was, was a young man at Cambridge in school, and the uh, physics teachers would give out these sets of problems, kind of like homework, and he'd give it out, and they would go, like, do a problem a week because these were extremely difficult problems. Okay, so it's not like this is your homework assignment. It's like you work on these when you have time. It's an ongoing project. So when someone said, hey, Hawking, did you work on the problems? And he said, oh, no, I forgot all about it. Goes up in his room, comes down three hours later. He did all of them. Yeah. Well, he did, this is before he got sick. This is when he was like 21. He got so it was a genius. He's a genius. He's a genius. And he was like, oh, well, I thought he was in trouble, so he like knuckled down and did these things. But otherwise, he was about useless. He was going to like quit. He, in, he didn't want to work. He didn't want to do anything. And then blah, 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 he got sick. The only thing he had was his brain. And one uh, meanwhile, he managed to get married again sure, before he got, got sick again. But he only actually accomplished anything amazing in physics until after he got sick. He said he hadn't got sick, he never would have accomplished any of that because he wouldn't have had the drive or desire to do it. what she can't see. She is going and thanking God for her friends that will work in the optometrist and gives her lens, you know, different strains of lens that she can sew with, see with, or whatever, you know. And neighbors that will drive. And it's just, he just puts things in, he doesn't take something away, he doesn't put something else in his place, even if it's just your mind. So that's why the words drive and struggle just don't, he, he doesn't just take it away and just leave it, you know, or mm -hmm. this is your problem, you know, deal with it. He doesn't work that way. <coughs> so, yeah. anyway. Makes sense. All right, well, let's stop there and.